Thank you for coming in on another episode of Sorry for Rambling. Uh, I'm Alex Kack, as always, and today I am joined by Sarah Tyree, an Arizona Democrat running for the state Senate in Legislative District 22. Sarah, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Alex. I'm excited to be here. I'm happy to have you. Um, you know, first question is, how are you holding up? Uh, you know, we're... This is not the safest state to live in uh, right now, considering the public health crisis. You doing okay? Yeah, um, you know, interestingly enough, I left my full-time job in March so that I could campaign full-time. And literally a week later, we went into our pretty please stay home order, uh, you know, and it's only gotten worse <laughs> since then. So um, yeah, it's been fun. It's a good way to, uh to put Ducey's lack of order, so the, the pretty please stay home order. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're seeing a real crisis of leadership uh, here in, in this state, statewide right now. Uh, do, you, do you feel that that's central to your campaign and to your messaging? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think at a point in time, my opponent may have been the right choice, maybe. Um, but as Arizona moves forward, as our district moves forward, um, I think that it's time for change. And, and honestly, um, I think that there has been a lack of leadership in our district as well. We don't see our incumbents talking about COVID. We don't see them talking about staying healthy, staying safe, um, um, and pushing for, for PPE for our, for our frontline, um, caretakers, right? Our nurses, our firefighters, et cetera. And so I definitely want to be a voice for just moving things forward, being, I don't want, being progressive. And for me, progressive means you're about forward moving action. And so I think that it's time that, that we have elected officials who are about action rather than respectability. And, you know, I want to touch off of that. I mean, cause you are a, progressive running in a very conservative district, um, which uh, can't be an easy feat. But are, are, how are you finding that you're able to bridge the gap uh, between you and voters who, you know, might have, might not have given someone with your views a chance before? Yeah, so I think initially, you know, there was a lot of outside noise that talked about me not having a, a chance and hell, one, because I am a Democrat, two, because I'm a woman, I'm a young woman, I'm a woman of color. Um, and truly, all of those things have given me the leg up in this district, because when I go into spaces now that young people aren't typically in or people of color aren't typically in, um, people automatically know that I'm the one that's running for state Senate. And so for me, that's a win, right? Um, but when it comes to opening doors, I think being a veteran is probably the biggest door opener and it's probably the one that allows our, our right-leaning voters to be at least receptive to the things that I have to say um, and then truly just listening because I think that people feel like their legislators are untouchable and un unapproachable and so just being willing to listen to and validate them I think that also really helps. And so this is, if I, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time you've ran for elected office. Is that correct? It is. And, and what inspired you to go on this journey? Oh, man. Um, so it started about 10 years ago during my first undergrad degree. Um, I had left active duty. Um, and while on active duty, I had lost a few friends. Um, and, and that really kind of just destroyed me emotionally. And so I felt like I was not ready to work one-on-one -on -one with clients. Um, so I decided to do macro work and in social work, that is policy. Um, so I applied for an internship with the Tennessee legislature and that was really my first look into policy, into voting, how um, bills turn into laws, et cetera. And, and I was just fascinated by it. But also it was at that point in time, and this was in 2011, that I saw so many different legislators on both sides of the party who were voting against their morals because the party in the sky told them to, right? And so for me, that was just not, that was not something that I was supportive of. Um, fast forward to about 2016, 
Um, I moved to Utah for a short while where I worked as the legislative liaison for the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. Um, so it was my job to head their policy team, to write bills, to educate legislators on how those bills would affect their constituents um, and testify in committee hearings. And, and that really just renewed that passion for me. Um, but during that time, I experienced my own domestic violence um, and then had to get a protective order against my partner. Um, I got evicted from my place of residence. I lost my job all because of that. Um, and so I'm here I am homeless, suffering from PTSD and essentially Stockholm syndrome, um, trying to get services through the VA. And it took the VA four months to schedule me an appointment. And so I kind of felt like with me and, and the privilege that I do have, um, me being as high functioning as I am and having this much trouble getting help, what is it like for people who have less than me? Um, and so that was really the decision in saying that if I put this off any longer, um, you know, I, might, I may just end up not running. And so now is the time to do that. Well, it's a, it's a huge jump and it's a, it's a big risk and it's a scary one and uh, it takes, takes a lot of courage to do so. Um, probably, you know, given your background, not the thing that's taken the most courage uh, in your life, but it's not, not an easy task for anyone, especially in the type of district you're running in where people will tell you you can't win it before you even start. Um, I want to tie off, you know, we were talking about some of the issues and some of the failures of the you know, state leadership in regards to the coronavirus pandemic, but uh, you decided to run before that. I'm assuming that you had other policies and goals that you wanted to accomplish. What are some of the things that you really wanted to, to pursue and, and try to bring to Arizona and the legislature? Absolutely. So my biggest platform is veteran care. Um, Arizona is home to some of the largest population in the country for veterans. I believe that we have over 600,000 registered veterans here. Um, and and we don't, as Arizona, we don't really have a lot of services for our veterans. Um, you know, the VA was in the news not too long ago about the lack of and the poor quality of services that they provided to, to veterans. Um, and in my district specifically, we have a lot of retirees. You know, we are known as one of the retiree districts. Um, and so, and also Luke is right down the street. So we have a very large population here. And, and for me personally, finding the lack of services, it's also a lot of work for me to drive all the way downtown to get help, right? Um, and so thinking about our elders, it's even, it's even more of a struggle for them to get down there. And so one of the things that I wanna fight for is ensuring that veterans have access to community providers and that coverage and that service is covered. Um, if, if we have a provider that's in our own neighborhood, we should be able to go and see that person, right? Um, additionally, a lot of states have um, property tax exemption laws for veterans. Now, technically, Arizona has that law, but what the law says is we will give up to $3,000 um, in property tax exemptions if your property is valued at less than $10,000 whose property is valued at less than $10,000. That doesn't even make sense. Um, you know, so, and that, that's just another one of those things where Arizona can say, oh, we have a law like that. But then when you actually read the law, it doesn't do anything for anyone. So in talking to other veterans, they feel like they are okay with having property taxes so long as those taxes go to veteran run services. Um, so that's one of the other things that I want to fight for. And also we have a lot, we have a large population of female veterans, um, but we don't have services specific to them. Um, homelessness, um, military sexual trauma, PTSD, et cetera. There isn't a lot of services that are directly fit to women of the military. Um, so that's another thing that I would like to further. Um, education is a big one for me, not necessarily funding because there are a lot of great advocates in funding. Um, what I fight for is a revamp of our education system. Um, when you and I were in school, we had uh, trade classes such as woodworking, welding, automotive, home ec, et cetera, and a lot of schools don't have that anymore. Now that is, um, it's a privilege to have those things, right? And, those, and the schools that have those are the schools that have money. 
Um, so what I would like to do is one, look at the classes that our, our students are taking and see what the long term uh, impact on them is. And if it's not an impact that they can use in their adult life, then let's replace those classes with skill sets that will. Um, and that might look like building relationships um, with businesses within that local area so that, that those youth can have internship opportunities while they're in high school. So by then, um, you know, they've been able to experience different professions and have a better idea of what they might want to do when they graduate. Um, but also they already have work experience on their resume so that they can come out and have a job, um, you know, and the experience needed to, to get hired. Um, so that's one of the really big things that I would focus on. Um, what else do we have? Child safety. So I grew up in the foster care system, um, and I know how dangerous it can be. Um, and so I think that was the reason why I ended up becoming a social worker was because of the experiences that I had. But now that I'm a provider, I see so much danger, unnecessary danger for our, our children and our families. So what I would like to do is, one, dismantle DCS from top to bottom. It needs to be rebuilt, restructured, um, and you have to have people in there who actually have social service backgrounds. Because as it stands right now, you don't have to have a social work degree, a sociology degree, uh, et cetera. You just have to have a four-year degree, period. So you could be a banker, a historian, whatever, and yet we are giving you the power to decide whether a child lives or dies. That's unacceptable. Um, and so I really think that in addition to restructuring DCS and putting in new standards and policies, we need to have um, a community-led multidisciplinary oversight team that includes lawyers, doctors, nurses, social workers, teachers, faith leaders, um, graduated DCS families so that they can hold DCS accountable and say, that's not okay. Or, you know, this is the policy that we would like to see instead, because currently DCS is a free for all. They can do whatever they want with however much money they want. And so rather than removing children from their home and putting them in another dangerous situation, why don't we just teach those positive parenting skills that keeps families together? Um, and then um, economic growth in the Far West Valley, for whatever reason, the Far West Valley is still considered rural, even though we're not. Um, and so we're seeing a residential growth, um, but we don't have the capacity and the infrastructure to um, meet the needs of that growth, right? Whether it's our roads, our healthcare system, our education system, um, et cetera, we just don't have the, the capability to to meet that growth need, but also to keep the money within our cities. Um, you know, I live in Surprise, and most of the people who live in Surprise have to drive all the way into town for work. That means that any money that they're making or any money that they're spending is going somewhere other than Surprise. So why not, you know, create a better infrastructure for the Far West Valley that allows us to um, meet the needs of our residents? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because you touched on so many things that I, I, I want to jump off there. I mean, you're talking about the issues with child safety um, and, and the need to kind of restructure that department top to bottom. Uh, it reminds me of a lot of the conversations that we're having in regards to, to law enforcement agencies in this country right now. Um, and I think that this is, this is a continuing theme that some, some people are not maybe understanding that there's a lot of different agencies that provide some level of public value, public service but that are, are fundamentally broken and flawed. And especially in states like ours right now, where we do need to, to kind of clean house and, and rebuild it from the ground up and create oversight. Are there other parts of the state government or, or even of the local governments where you see that being necessary? Every single one, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oppression, oppression and, and racial bias is, is inherent in this country. And it literally is in every single thing. Uh, we think about education, we only learn about European history. You know, we're not learning about history for other cultures. And if we by chance do, it's usually very incremental and often demonizing to those cultures. So 
that that's a beginning because everything starts with education. That is the foundation. And so I think if we're going to start looking at true, uh, true change of reform, it has to start with education. Um, really, you can think about the injustice system, the school to prison pipeline, private prisons specifically, um, employment, right? Um, for me personally, I have a very, I have a very white name. You know, I, I am half white, my mother's Irish, red hair and freckled. And when people look at my resume, they're expecting a white girl. And then when I walk into interviews, you can literally see their faces drop because I'm not what they expected me to be. And so that biasness, that profiling, that racism um, has seemed to, in the last four years, uh, grown or become more outward. Uh, and so a part of me is thankful that those things are happening because now it shows us the areas that we need to work on. Um, and the other part of it is it, it makes me fear for my life. It makes me fear for my, my brothers and my sisters, you know. So there's literally everything needs to be reformed from top to bottom. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um... Moving forward, uh, one other thing I wanted to, to, to touch on there was uh, something that I, it was close to my own personal memory. So I grew up in Phoenix. I grew up in the West Valley, um, but not the far West Valley, which is a whole different thing. And, you know, like you said, it, it's, it's still considered rural. When I was a kid, it was fairly rural. Uh, it is not now, though. Uh, that was a huge shock the first time going back home for me to realize is that what everyone has out there, it, it is developed at least residentially, you know, and, and this seems to be an issue with the Phoenix metro area in general, where there's this continued development for residential purposes of, of the sprawl. It keeps moving out where they build more housing units, but we're not seeing jobs follow them. What do you think is the role of the state in, in kind of redirecting some of this, some of this some resources, I guess, to try to rectify the situation. I mean, I mean, are we looking at loan programs or, you know, some type of uh, mandate? I mean, how, how do we address this? So for me personally, I'm not a huge fan of loans um, because typically loans are designed to keep uh, lower income, middle class, uh, impoverished communities in those categories. Um, and so I believe that if we are going to give tax credits, right, because we love to give tax credits to multi-million dollar companies, we should be giving those tax credits to um, small businesses, businesses that hire less than 500 people, um, because those typically are the companies who are truly caring for their employees. You know, they acknowledge that sometimes there are family emergencies. They acknowledge that you might need a mental health day, um, you know, or childcare, et cetera. And so those, those are the companies that I think that we should be giving tax credits to. Um, thinking about jobs in general or um, economics in general, one of the issues that I have a problem with is if we're going to raise, which we should, if we're going to raise uh, the minimum wage, we cannot continue to inflate the economy at the same time. Otherwise, what is the purpose? I don't understand why we would raise minimum wage just to also raise um, the cost of living. Um, so I think that as the legislature, we have to be able to say that, well, yes, we are going to raise the minimum wage um, because Arizona still falls under um, many other states in the country as far as minimum wage goes. Um, we have to put a cap on the cost of living. Um, it, 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 just, it just doesn't make sense. You know, when, when, when I hear people say, we have the highest uh, or the lowest unemployment rate in the nation and, and, and for so long or whatever. Well, yeah, because people are working two and three jobs just to survive. They're not working two and three jobs and they're thriving. They're still barely making ends meet because these jobs don't pay them enough. Um, and so I think that it's important that we start holding our employers accountable, um, not only in, in how much that we're paying people, but that we're giving them opportunities for career progression. Um, so I, that, I guess that's really where I feel, you know, the legislature comes in is that sometimes 
we, we put too many policies in areas that don't really need governing, and then we leave the areas that do need governing unattended. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the classic thing here, right? We, we, we want to get into everyone's bedroom, but we never want to sit in a boardroom. That's, that's been kind of the Arizona state government motto for as long as I can remember. Um, that has to change because we are not allowing people to live their best lives. And we are certainly not uh, making sure that they are protected and able to do so in the workplace. We're getting towards the, uh, the end of the program here. And I like to end all of these by asking uh, the same question, which is always a huge break from the rest of the discussion. But you know, throughout your campaign and, and you know, your service uh, to this nation before that, what has been the thing that's been most important for you to try to convey to other people? What is it that you really want to put back out there into the world? Um, I think two things. One is that I am not the voice of the party or any party. I am the voice of the people. I fullheartedly believe that whatever party I personally subscribe to needs to be set aside when I am legislating, right? In order for someone to represent their entire district, they have to be able to be as bipartisan as possible. Um, so I, I think that that speaks to a lot of people because a lot of us are um, feeling very disenfranchised and, and unhappy with any party that people are subscribing to at this point. The two-party system just needs to go away. Um, I would say that the other part of it has been that really encouraging young voters to get out, right? Because we know that our elders are the ones that they understand their duty and their civic responsibility and they get out and vote, but it happens to be the young people 35 and below who don't engage yet. And so I think that me being, um, me running for office has let a lot of people see themselves. Um, and so they feel more inclined to educate themselves about the electoral process, especially here um, locally and learning about down ballot races rather than just focusing on the federal races. Um, and so that has just been, I think, one of my favorite things about this campaign is just seeing how many people are for the first time being engaged because they saw someone who represented them. Well, thank you so much. That is Sarah Tyree, Democratic candidate in Arizona's 22nd district. This is Sorry for Rambling. I'm Alex Kack, and we'll see you next time.